Uh, hi, uh, I'm Jeffrey Zonder. I appreciate the invitation to come speak with you today about uh, how amyloidosis uh, uh, affects the kidneys and uh, how we assess uh, kidney injury uh, in the setting of amyloidosis and also um, the strategies for uh, reducing uh, that damage. Um, I work at the Carmanos Cancer Institute in Detroit, Michigan, where I'm the leader of the multiple myeloma and amyloidosis multidisciplinary team. So first, let's just talk a little bit about amyloidosis. Uh, as um, many of you probably know, this is a, a group of various diseases characterized by uh, misfolded proteins. Um, and the type of amyloidosis, which I'll, I'll go into in just a little bit, is uh, classified according uh, to the misfolded protein type. Uh, these misfolded proteins uh, self-aggregate uh, and uh, form uh, fibrils. Uh, which can then form extracellular deposits in body tissues. And the symptoms patients have depend on which organs these uh, deposits uh, uh, form in. Um, it's also important to understand that in um, one of the most common types of amyloidosis, uh, light chain amyloidosis, the misfolded proteins themselves, while they're soluble, are also toxic to the organs. And uh, there's quite a bit of data to show that um, cardiomyocytes uh, and also um, uh, in the kidney, mesangial cells are directly affected um, by the uptake of misfolded light chains. Um, so the most important first step is securing an accurate diagnosis. The likelihood of a specific organ being involved is uh, dramatically um, impacted by the type of amyloid we're dealing with. So the, the, the nomenclature system for amyloidosis is A for amyloid, followed by some abbreviation uh, that uh, describes the, uh, the misfolded protein that forms the fibrils. So for instance, I mentioned AL amyloid, that's amyloid light chain. Um, the other most common type is uh, ATTR, which is transthyretin amyloidosis, and there are um, uh, different varieties of that uh, with mutated uh, forms of transthyretin, and there's also uh, a type called wild type where, where there is no mutation in the transthyretin molecule, but it um, still forms amyloid deposits uh, as people age. Um, I mentioned here AA amyloidosis, and AL and AA amyloid are much, much more likely to affect the kidney uh, than ATTR. Um, the, uh, one of the other interesting types of um, uh, kidney uh, amyloid is LEC2 uh, amyloidosis, or ALEC2, uh, which uh, is uh, not associated with uh, any uh, known mutation or polymorphism in the LEC2 protein, um, but there does seem to be some ethnic predisposition. So people of um, Mexican uh, heritage uh, seem to be most commonly affected, and then there are some other um, pockets such as um, um, native populations, for instance, in uh, the, the northwest, in, in northwest uh, Canada, uh, for instance. Um, now, um, what I'm showing here on the bottom is a glass slide with a biopsy, and this is how we, we figure out what type we're talking about here. Uh, we have this glass slide. This actually is a picture of a uh, kidney biopsy. You can apply Congo red staining, uh, which gives the characteristic apple green birefringence. That's how you know that the protein deposits we're seeing in the organ are actually amyloid. Um, we're, we're, that, that birefringence is when you uh, look at uh, Congo red stained uh, 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 tissue under polarized light. Once you've identified an amyloid deposit, you can micro dissect it uh, off of a slide, uh, and then you can do tandem mass spec. Uh, and based on the, the peptide profile that we see uh, when we do this testing, uh, we can have like a we, we can arrive at characteristic profiles for any known type of amyloidosis. Um, uh, and um, uh, again, uh, this this is really, really important because um, I'm going to go into um, uh, a treatment strategy for AL amyloidosis, and that's going to be the main focus of today's talk. But many of the things that I'm talking about wouldn't be relevant at all if it were a different type of amyloid affecting the kidney. So knowing what you're starting with is really important in terms of predicting risk of progression uh, and also um, deciding on a treatment strategy. So... Uh, in AL amyloidosis, uh, we should remember that uh, this is a plasma cell disorder. 
Um, there are clonal plasma cells in the bone marrow that make misfolded light chains. And remember that light chains are uh, uh, fragments of uh, immunoglobulins. Um, these misfolded light chains uh, can form toxic soluble oligomers uh, or clumps, uh, and then they can form larger strands that deposit in organs. Um, and um, in terms of uh, measuring uh, light chains, really we only can measure the, the, uh, the, the soluble light chains using um, a serum-free light chain assay. Um, uh, and our, our goal of therapy is to reduce the production of um, measurable uh, light chains, uh, which is like turning off the faucet to reduce the, uh, the, the subsequent production, downstream production of these tissue uh, damaging oligomers and fibrils. And so our therapy uh, right now, the standard therapy uh, targets plasma cells to try and shut down this production. Uh, and usually we use a combination of chemotherapy and antibody therapy uh, in 2023 based on the results of randomized studies. Um, now, uh, the way that um, AL amyloidosis injures the kidney is different uh, than the way multiple myeloma, which is a plasma cell cancer, uh, injures the kidney. In multiple myeloma, you um, might remember that uh, it, it causes a kidney injury uh, most commonly called cast nephropathy. Um, and cast nephropathy uh, is basically uh, filtered light chains, not misfolded light chains, but just filtered light chains basically uh, for, uh, uh, aggregate with other proteins, um, TAM horsefall protein, and, and form these clumps uh, in the distal um, uh, tubular uh, system uh, in the kidneys. And uh, certain, you know, very high levels of light chains, but also dehydration or high calcium levels um, and other factors can contribute to the risk of developing uh, this kind of uh, kidney injury. We don't generally see cast nephropathy in amyloidosis. Uh, amyloidosis, uh, AL amyloidosis, affects the kidney at the other end in the filtration system, the glomerulus. Uh, remember, I mentioned that um, uh, uh, misfolded light chains are toxic to mesangial cells uh, in the glomerulus. Um, and uh, as a result of this, you get extreme amounts of protein leakage. So, where, you know, whereas in myeloma, you know, if you were, if you were excreting 1,000 milligrams per day of light chains, that would be quite a bit of light chains uh, in your urine. But when you uh, injure the glomerulus uh, in amyloidosis, you might have 5 grams of protein a day, 10 grams of protein a day, even more. Um, uh, and it's predominantly, uh, it, it's, it's a nonspecific proteinuria, so it's going to be predominantly albuminuria based on what's in our blood, right? Um, and when you get uh, excessive amounts of proteinuria, um, that uh, overwhelms uh, the cubulin megalin system in the proximal tubules, uh, and uh, you, that, that, that huge protein dump into the proximal tubules uh, causes uh, tubular injury um, uh, uh, downstream. Um, so uh, you get both um, huge amounts of protein and then over time you get uh, decreased um, uh, creatinine clearance because of um, the resultant kid kidney injury. So our goal of treatment right now, as I said, is shutting down the production of these light chains that injure the kidney. Uh, and, and, and other organs. And you can usually do that pretty quickly with treatment. Um, uh, the, the treatments I measure, mentioned before, I mean, usually within uh, four weeks or eight weeks, uh, you see a major reduction in light chain production. Um, and the deeper, the better. We, we try to aim for normalization of the abnormal light chain levels uh, with treatment. And we want that to be uh, uh, sustained uh, so that organs have a chance to bounce back. 
Um, while uh, that's happening, it's important to have a team in place to sort of manage the ongoing organ toxicity because uh, organ responses lag behind hematologic responses. You know, a hematologic response is the light chain response, but organ responses lag behind it by months and sometimes by more than a year. Um, and the, the, um, in amyloidosis, um, the symptoms uh, and risk, and uh, that, you know, in the case of heart involvement, that's that's a risk of arrhythmias, congestive heart failure, and death. In the kidneys, it's more a risk of uh, event, uh, eventually developing end-stage kidney disease and needing to be on dialysis. It's related to how advanced the uh, injury is at the outset, because sometimes uh, there is a, a damage spiral, a vicious circle sort of set in motion uh, right from the get-go that's hard to pull out of. Um, it has to do with, I mean, and, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to sort of walk us through that and why, why that might be the case, why organs don't automatically just get better. Um, first, our, our, our bodies are not fast uh, or, or very effective at removing amyloid from organs once it's in the organ. Um, uh, we're also we also have imperfect ways of sort of assessing how organs are responding uh, to treatment. So, um, for instance, when we're trying to assess heart involvement, we look at blood markers like the NT pro BNP, um, or um, in some cases, imaging studies like an echocardiogram. With the liver, the primary lab we follow is the alkaline phosphatase, and with the kidneys, we're measuring. Uh, 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 the degree of protein that's leaking per day, and we're also measuring um, the glomerular filtration rate uh, of, uh, of the kidney as well, and that's uh, derived by knowing what a patient's uh, serum creatinine uh, is, along with other factors. Um, and so usually what we're looking for, when with the lab tests, we're looking for improvement in these numbers. So, um, uh, so reduction in proteinuria uh, without uh, further decline in uh, filtration rate is the main thing we're looking for with the kidney. And with best available therapy, 50 to 60 percent of patients will have a kidney response. But the, the, the definition of a kidney response, and this is where, what I'm saying, it's, it's imperfect. The definition of a kidney response is a 30 percent reduction in the daily protein leakage, right? And so if you think about what I said before, that sometimes you can have extremely high levels of protein leakage, you know, a 30 percent reduction if you're starting at 15 or 20 grams a day leaves you with a ton of proteinuria. And so even if you technically have a response, you are still in the range where you're dumping enough protein each day that it causes ongoing kidney injury. This, these facts are sort of the basis, the underpinnings of what we call the, the, the renal staging system or the Pavia renal staging system. And basically, this system that was uh, developed by um, uh, amyloidosis specialists uh, in uh, the Italian amyloidosis program, uh, along with um, colleagues from uh, the German amyloidosis group, um, show that if at the outset of a patient's diagnosis, um, the degree of uh, kidney impairment measured by the, the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate, plus the degree of proteinuria predict the likelihood of going on to develop end-stage dialysis requiring kidney injury. Um, and so the cutoffs are proteinuria of 5 grams per day and an estimated GFR of 60 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared. And um, if you have neither of these, uh, your risk of subsequent dialysis, assuming you're able to get a hematologic response, is actually pretty close to zero. But if you have both of them, your risk of uh, uh, ending up on dialysis within the first two to three years is 40 or 50 percent, according to this paper. Uh, if you have one or the other, your risk is kind of somewhere in between there. Now, you can affect this risk, as I sort of hinted at a, a moment ago, by getting a hematologic response. The risk is not as high if the, if the genes can be controlled and ongoing amyloid deposition uh, is controlled. Also, um, 
Um, not all uh, groups have uh, found this exact same degree of risk. So for instance, the Boston University group, uh, which uh, is a huge transplant center, um, in contrast to the patients who are treated in this original paper who were generally treated with non-transplant therapy, and I'm talking about stem cell transplant, um, the risk of um, uh, dialysis with patients who were stage three was about half as high in the Boston study as it was in this Italian study. So uh, it, it was still predictive, but the degree of risk was not exactly the same. So uh, I think what this gets at is, first of all, it, it, it tells us um, making an early accurate diagnosis and getting patients started on treatment before they already have advanced organ involvement is key. Um, and it also uh, allows us to provide patients with some, uh, uh, you know, appropriate expectations about um, things that might happen or things that probably won't. Um, I'm going to close out by saying that we are beginning to explore uh, new um, new strategies to try and uh, impact organ responses. Uh, right now, there are uh, randomized studies underway of antibodies, one's called bertamumab, it used to be called NEOD001, and one is called ancilamumab, and that used to be called Cal101. These are both antibodies that target amyloid fibrils and probably uh, the uh, and, and also the, the toxic soluble oligomers although that's a little bit harder to measure um, but it, they don't target free light chains um, and they don't target importantly plasma cells I mean what these antibodies do is they coat these uh, tissue deposited antibody fibrils and they help the immune system clear uh, these fibrils more rapidly and so it's 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 hitting the process at both ends where where uh, the, the randomized studies right now that are being done with both of these agents are in cardiac patients and it's uh, standard therapy with chemotherapy and anti-plasma cell uh, uh, antibodies cd38 antibodies um, with or without these fibril directed antibodies to see if simultaneous targeting of the plasma cells producing the light chains and downstream targeting the deposits that are already there leads to more rapid and more complete organ responses. Uh, we'll see. Uh, jury's out. Um, we do have some hints that this uh, may uh, this strategy may work from our early stage studies with ancilamumab, and also in a previously uh, uh, conducted randomized study. Um, uh, where you uh, where there seemed to be some improvement. Uh, in cardiac outcomes in patients with the most advanced cardiac involvement treated with bertamumab. Um, so um, in the next year or two, it's expected that we will see um, results, uh, the, the first results from these ongoing studies uh, in cardiac amyloid patients. And if, the, if it turns out to work, it's certainly going to be a strategy that's applied to uh, renal uh, involvement as well. Uh, and with that, I will um, wrap it up. And um, thank you so much for your attention today.